Amen and amen. If you would be seated, and I hope you have a copy of God's Word this morning with me. And if you do, open there to Mark chapter 4. As you're turning to Mark chapter 4, we'll pick up in verse 26. And as you're opening there, we have some of our younger children here pulling their tables to them. We've still got our summer series sidewalk chalk note taking on the black butcher paper. And guys, there aren't as many kiddos in the service. Adults, put it to good use. I know some of you've got some good artistic ability. Express yourself. Because the reality is, I'm not about to give a message. We're not about to continue in a message that L.A. just let us in. We're about to hear from the maker of heaven and earth through his word speak to our lives. And we want to be engaged in that. And we want to be receptive to that because in his words, through the word incarnate, there is life everlasting. Amen? So we're at Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 26 to 34. And this is what the Word of God says. And Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should spread seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises. Night and day pass. And the seed sprouts and grows. But he knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle in because the harvest has come. And then Jesus looks around and he says again, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? And he says the kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest Of all the seeds on the earth, yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the other garden plants. And not only that, but it puts out large branches that the birds of the air can make their nest in it. The last two verses say, With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Jesus did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. We continue to chapter 4 today, and as you may remember a couple weeks ago, all throughout chapter 4, Jesus is using a specific style of teaching, parabolic teaching. He's using parables, two words put together where Jesus uses illustrative stories of coming alongside one another, these illustrative stories, and they're coming alongside one another and using the comparisons to highlight the truth he wants to make known to those in the crowds. He's continuing today in today's passage using parables, but a focus has shifted. We're up to this point in chapter 4. Jesus has really focused on the posture of mankind's heart. Remember, he he spoke about how his use of parables was that truth is there. It's not concealed, but truth is actually revealed to the extent that your heart posture is humble and sincere of faith on what Jesus teaching if you come to a place faith seeking understanding if you simply come and say Jesus I hear what you're talking about you're saying it's very significant and I want to place my faith on you that you are who you say you are would you give me understanding and he says come on in child let me share with you the fullness of this truth and knowledge but now today in verse 26 there's another um, variation or a pivot where no longer are we focusing or emphasizing the posture of man's heart but now we're getting to see specifically The posture of Jesus and his heart as it relates to the kingdom of God. I tell you what, first time LA's been in our building. And those last two songs, turning your eyes on Jesus, us affirming and agreeing and reminding one another of, of his goodness, of where even when we don't feel it, we know he's working. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when 48 hours before our fourth regathering service, the world is turned upside down in some other unpredictable fashion and the appearances all around us seem unpromising. We know he is working. And what's so powerful about this, I'm going to give you the whole sermon here, but I'm still going to speak a little more, okay? Just hang with me, trust me. What's so powerful about this and the, the two parables that Jesus teaches here is that the portrait of the the kingdom that that comes into focus here in these two parables, it requires the listener to give all attention and focus 
not toward what mankind can accomplish, but all the accomplishments and achievements that God Almighty provides as maker of heaven and earth. We see here in the reminder of these two parables how God does only what He can do in ways and methods that only He can provide and in a timing as the Father of lights that only He desires that is never late. But we also know in God's timing, it's never early either. But even in unpromising appearances, He reminds us, yeah, it might not look like you wish it does, it might not feel the way you drew it up on the, the planning chart. But trust my process. My process is right. My process is better. The journey that I'm inviting you to join, the story that I want you to be a part of in my kingdom is best, child. So, so come with me. So Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. It's as if a man, a farmer, an ag guy, would go out and, and spread seed on the ground. And he would go about his business as anybody would do, planting seeds. He, he would spread the seed on the ground, and then he would sleep and he would rise. Days would go by, nights would go by, night after day, maybe weeks or months after planting that seed. And then finally it comes about what is supposed to happen actually happens. The seed sprouts and grows. But so interestingly it says the guy who planted the seeds, the guy who should be fully aware of what's going on, when the growth actually happens, he can't tell you how the growth actually happened. The culture Jesus was among during that time, as you may know, were very agrarian. These were some folks who really knew farming. They really knew the agriculture. In my mind, it just makes my heart warm as a fighting Texas Aggie class of 07. Whoop! These must have been some good old A&M agricultural and mechanical kind of folks. Amen? No, too far of a stretch. Okay, now, there we go. One we got one other sinner in here, okay? Let's get back to the word. A lot of similarities with the region we find ourselves here, historic Katy. Not just 30 years ago or so, this whole region was just inundated with, with rice farmers, rice fields. People here know agriculture, know the farming industry. You, you go around historic Katy still today and you, you see rice plants on the street signs. If you pay attention to our church logo, our circle cross, there is a plant on the cross that is a rice plant. The constant reminder of our unique calling planted here as a local expression of the bride in the heart of Katie, to the hearts of Katie, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is talking to this culture that is very in tune as, um, as far as the agriculture and farming industry goes. And these references would have hit very um, close to home for them. They, they understood what was going on. He, when he says, you know what it's like. Someone goes out and they spread seed on the ground. They, they plant it and Night goes by, day goes by, you sleep, you rise, you work, you water it. And they, they understood that. And he went further and said, you also understand that as much as you do know about the planting process and putting the seeds in the soil and watering it and trusting it, you know that when it actually comes to the growth, that transformation that happens, when the germination process happens, when the roots begin to take hold in the soil and actual growth comes up, you know, even in farming, as wise as you are and experienced you are, you have such a limited understanding of how that actually happens. Where he continues and he says, a little more clarity there in verse 28, he says, the earth produces by itself. First, the blade, right? We know that little piece of green that pops up from the, breaks the surface of the soil. I can remember taking beans home as a young child in Sunday school and being so excited that very next day a little blade pops up and the very next day it dies and then mom and daddy have to replace it to keep my spirits high. But that little blade comes up and then after a while an ear comes up and then the full grain inside that ear comes and, and the growth happens. And within this growth, this transformation from something that seemed to have no life whatsoever has now have had life into it and it exists so full and so abundant. And, and in this parable, absolutely a reminder that there is this unexplainable factor when it comes to growth. He says, the earth produces by itself the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. Remember, he's talking about the kingdom of God. So what's going on here? It's 
what he's telling these crowds is that when it comes to growth in the kingdom of God, it's a mystery. There's a limited capacity. There's an unexplainable factor that your finite ability can only take you so far, but then when it comes to the actual growth of that which you have entrusted in, you've got to entrust God with the growth. You don't want me messing with the growth. I don't want you messing with the growth. God says you have your role, you have your limited understanding of spreading the seed and planting it, but then growth and transformation must be entrusted to the care of the maker of heaven and earth. Notice what that means. What it means automatically, as he says in the next verse, when growth is entrusted to God, no matter how smart or foolish you may think you are, when growth is truly entrusted with God and to God, harvest comes 100% of the time. That's why he so quickly goes on to the, the following role. He, he says, here's your role in, in planting the seed. The, the kingdom of God is as if a man sows seed. But then there comes a point where the growth has to be entrusted with God. It is out of, out of your ability, outside of your capacity. God provides the transformation to a newness of life. But anytime you trust God with the growth, here comes an inevitable harvest. So it says, when the grain is ripe. At once, he puts the sickle in. What is a sickle? It's, it's a mini version of Elmer Fudd's weapon that he goes to capture Bugs Bunny with these days. Come on, anybody current events? You're keeping up with that, right? It's a double barrel shotgun, but okay, we know what we're talking about. It comes 100% of the time. Why? Because the harvest has come. That gives us hope. Because... What we see around us. I mean, there's a fraction of us here today than there was last week. Don't hear me wrong. I'm so grateful y'all are here. Come back, please. But because of the crazy around us, because of what might, some might qualify as unpromising appearances or uncomfortable scenarios, the gathering of God's people in person as he has designed us to be part of his process of the kingdom of God is being hindered, is being impeded. We're being discouraged and having hesitation. But what this is saying is, trust the process, child. Even when it doesn't look like it, things are progressing along my timeline. Trust the growth to me. So much so that he devotes a whole other parable to it. Remember, at this point in chapter 4, Jesus has said almost half a dozen times, anyone who has ears, let him hear. Hey, listen up. Behold, basically, hey, pay attention. I'm only here a few years on earth. Don't miss it. And then here he gives a whole other parable emphasizing the reality is talked about, the growth and trust of the God. Making certain that they realize when growth is trusted to God, the harvest is inevitable. This is what it says. He comes up with this question. Imagine the crowds there. Remember, these crowds consist of a variety of folks. Some are those who are just set out to reject Jesus, have no sincerity of heart to, to in, um, inquire what he's about. And for them, it's really a double whammy, right? When, when Jesus comes in and says, I'm the, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, it's really a double whammy on this revolutionary scale. He, he says, I'm the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I've got a kingdom I'm preaching. What does that, that mean? It's threatening the authority of the Roman Empire there, but also of his very own, the Jews themselves. What he's saying he is fulfilling and, and what his kingdom truly is about. It so radically subverts all that they have known and all they're hoping for. Turns their expectations completely upside down. But in the second parable to these crowds, he comes up. You've got those rejecting him. You've got his own disciples. And you've got people, maybe like some of you here today, who are genuinely curious. I've heard about you. What is this Jesus really about? What does the relationship with him really look like? And so before these three types of people in the crowds, he says, how can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable shall we use for it? Imagine if God would take your advice on something. I can't help but pause here. Oh, come on, we imagine it sometimes. 
I can't help but think here, if, if he were to ask me, what can we compare the kingdom of God to? Well, the, the kingdom of God, something so mighty, that which is going to be eternal, that which is from the maker of heaven and earth, what can we compare it to? Well, how about the, the towering cedars of Lebanon? Or, or surely Jesus would, would reference the, the outstretching branches of the large sycamore tree that Zacchaeus used to, to get a clear view of, of Messiah coming down the road. Or, or maybe, if he doesn't do anything Middle Eastern, maybe he'd choose something from our Western civilization. The redwoods that are 30 feet in diameter, towering more than 300 foot in the air. Jesus sets it up and he says, no. Quit going with what you expect. Quit going with what seems obvious. My kingdom is not like that. Most appropriate to compare my kingdom to would be the grain of a mustard seed. And then he clarifies what that really is. The smallest of all the seeds. Not just in the Middle East. Not just on the continent there. Of all the seeds in all the world. Because my kingdom is like that. Because there are so many elements of it and who I am and what I'm about. That doesn't automatically line up with humanity's expectations. He says, but notice, this seed, though the smallest of all the seeds in all the world, when it's sown in the ground, it grows up larger than all the garden plants. It's larger than anything out there in the garden. It's not the largest tree, but it provides a shade for the birds. He says, although it may seem unpromising in the scenarios around you, what is taking place is an assurance that that which I began will be seen through completion in my name. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will carry it out into completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Even when I don't see it, I know He's working. Even when I don't feel it, I know He's working. And saying around you, you might not think this is what it lines up or I line up with what you thought I should be. But let me assure you, there's this timeline of my kingdom, the progression of how I work. And if you trust it to me, you will see the desired harvest come. So think about this. Where do we live right now? We live in Katy, Texas, in the age of the church, right? We had creation. We had the fall of mankind. We had a nation established, the nation of Israel, that Messiah might come for all humanity. We had the law given. Then we had the law fulfilled in Jesus. He died, he rose again, and now we, we follow him as believers. And, and we're in this in-between time where the kingdom has been inaugurated. Jesus is, is king of my heart, but I don't see his physical kingdom on the earth yet. And I don't see things getting better either. I, I can't help but uh, affirm that. But we know the full manifestation of his kingdom is coming. So what these two parables remind us about is we need to see the kingdom of God like Jesus sees the kingdom of God. What is Jesus' heart toward the kingdom of God? It's that we're living in a time where our full devotion should be trusting Him and spreading the seed of the gospel. In and out of global pandemic season. On and off of social media comment boards and postings. Social distancing and non-social distancing grocery lines. As if you're a farmer spreading seed and trusting God for the growth. So we're doing seed sown everywhere, preparing for harvest. Verses 33 and 34, it says, these were just like the other parables where the people had the opportunity to ask for an understanding. So when we come to a place of humility, we say, okay, God, what does this mean? What, what are you really getting at here? The kingdom of God, kingdom growth, it's mysterious, yes, but what is the heart that Jesus is getting at? What he wants us to know here is he's got this process. We've got a finite capacity. So here it is. Don't limit God's process based on our understanding. The temptation is we look at the world around us 
And it doesn't feel like God's doing things like we wish he would or perhaps he should. And we start trying to pull down him who is above us and outside of our ways and put him in our flow charts of expectations and limits his process, his divine order within what we think should be best. I don't know about y'all, but I'm, I'm worn out. These last two days, if you're on any of our leadership correspondence, I sent out like half a dozen updates. Here's update 2.0-75. I don't know. It was insane. At this time, here's what we're doing. That's what I open everything with. Because at this time, based on the latest information, here's what we're doing. Try not to kill off all humanity while still gathering in person. And striking that balance of making 50% of people happy and 49.9% of people unhappy. That's just where we are. And the temptation, if I'm being real honest, is God, that which is unfolding around us does not seem very promising. I've been a pastor here since 2017. We came in. Our family and I, August 2017, catastrophic hurricane. Like catastrophic where we put to the tune of 600 grand of improvements to our building afterward over the next two years. Wow. Next year was followed by staff turnover. The next year, just last summer, huge fallout in our finance department and business office. That yours truly had the pleasure of leading? No, that, that's not fun. The sickness of sin is not fun. And then we come to 2020, around in the corner, and we're seeing billboards all across Houston. We're hearing all of our favorite podcasts say, 2020 Vision, Sermon Series, check it out. We've got clarity for this next year. And God said, no, let me remind you, child. You can plan all these things. You can think you've got an idea, but let me remind you, I direct your steps and I am sovereign over all things. You're not in control. you got no idea how the growth happens. And the temptation for me is to allow the unpromising appearances unfolding around me to try to pull back some of those opportunities for growth and keep them in my own grasp rather than see it the way God sees it. And trust him for it, which always guarantees a harvest. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Paul experienced the same thing. He wrote a letter to the Philippians, and he provided great clarity on how they should look at that. And it gives it a good reminder for us today. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Paul was in prison. Paul, Apostolos Paulos, called to the Gentiles, called to go to the ends of the earth for the glory of God and the good of humanity. And he's in prison. Well, what good is that going to do? God, don't you know what's going on with your apostle? Don't you know what you called him to and now he's in chains? Surely this isn't the best opportunity for what you've called him to. Well, look what Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Say, what? Surely that was just sleep deprived. He wasn't thinking straightly. So that, verse 13, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold now to speak the word without fear. When you look at this time in Paul's life, the appearances did not seem very promising. And where the, the flesh side of our humanity wants to say that is a setback, that is a hindrance, that is impeding the calling of the gospel that God has on his life, Paul says, no, let me correct you. It is serving to advance the very calling that God has placed on me. The advancement of the gospel. The whole palace guard has heard about Jesus now. I would have never had the opportunity to get into this um, aspect and this, this angle and share the truth. And now I have. And not only did it advance the gospel rather than being a setback, but those in Philippi who heard the news became all the more bold in their own faith in sharing and planting seeds to the world around them. He trusted God in the unpromising appearances of life around him. 
quoted Jesus this morning. I've quoted Paul now. I want to quote someone outside of Scripture, but really quickly because we don't want to stay there. Winston Churchill. He said, optimists see opportunity in every difficulty. Optimists see opportunity in every difficulty. Now, I know that's Winston Churchill. We'll give him credit. I think Jesus came up with that a long time ago, guys. We look at this COVID season, the ups and downs. I've had conversations with many of you, dear friends, honest, sincere conversations, meaning well conversations that have said about, man, pastor, I just, I really wish we could as quickly as possible get back to normal. And I think I hear your heart there. I think I'm guilty of saying that some as well. But when we're honest with ourselves, I think our desire to get back to normal is because we want to get back to how we thought things should be. We want to get back to a place that was part of our original design and hopes and aspirations rather than honestly expose ourselves vulnerably, sincerely before God. And say, God, what do you want out of this? God, help me see the process and the journey of your story with me in it of your kingdom along the way. What if it's God's desire in his allowance of this global pandemic, in, in his allowance of us having three weeks of regathering and now to another just heightened place where, where I'm wearing a, a sweat scarf around my neck and stuff like that. What if God's sovereignty is allowing this to happen because his desire is we never get back to the way we were before? God's never about the former things. God's never about the old. He's always about transformation and bringing a newness of life like never before. A kingdom growth that is so mysterious but equally miraculous because it's all up to him. And there's nothing we can do other than scattering seed and trust him for it completely. Last place I want you to hear from this morning is Isaiah 43. Because I am longing for what I thought was normalcy, but what God showed me is I'm longing for a uh, regular rhythm of life. That's what I'm longing for. A regular rhythm of effective life and gospel ministry. I think that's okay. Because here Isaiah says, he's called us to this newness. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Remember not the former things. Nor consider the things of old. That's him saying, you better consider the idea that I don't want, ever want you going back to what you were before. Verse 19, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Jesus has shared these two parables in Mark. We see that with the backdrop of this corona season, this quarantine season, post-quarantine season, return to quarantine season. And if we sincerely say, God, what do you want us to understand? What he's shown us from Mark is that we cannot limit his process to our understanding, but we've got to trust him and say, God, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, however, wherever, whatever, whenever, Help me to trust you, even when it doesn't seem like you're still working along the way. You're here because you want to do that. I mean, you're here two days after a return to work, home, stay safe, Harris County order. That, that warms my heart more than any Texas A&M reference, okay? That, that overflows my cup. I want to encourage you with this morning. As we leave this place, don't get so caught up with what that fruit might look like. Don't get so caught up with um, what, what growth is happening. By the power of the Spirit and the direction that the kingdom of God is aimed toward, trust in the seeds that you're planting, sharing of your faith, and let God take care of the rest. Let's pray. Father God, 
Lord, these times are so crazy. And God, we do confess that too often. Me, me personally, I've looked within my own resources and strength rather than entrusting the growth to you. So God, at this moment, as your, your word has reminded us about the, the mystery and the miracle of, of the growth that comes in your kingdom, Lord, would you renew our commitment to do what we're called to do, just planting those seeds of truth, planting those seeds of your word, planting those seeds of our faith in you. And that when the appearances don't seem promising, especially when the world around us doesn't seem like it's lining up with you continuing to make progress in our lives, help us to fully trust you for the growth. Whatever you're up to during this season, God, we affirm that you're still in control. God, we affirm that even if we took every perfect precaution of safety, if you desire to allow it to happen, our whole church family could have the virus. Because you're a sovereign, you're in control. But God, in that same reality, may that spur us on and motivate us to trust you all the more in, in seeking and pursuing, trying to figure out what it is you want to make the most of during this season for your renown. Transformation and growth, do you want to breathe into our lives as a result of this global pause you have allowed to happen? God, as it draws us closer in relationship with you, we ask that you would use us as conduits to invite others into your story of redemption, that they might be transformed into a fullness of life. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name.